One of my favorite people in town is a guy named Vint Cerf. You ever heard of him? Yeah. He's ba he basically invented the internet. He got uh, packets to fly across fiber optics. Unbelievable guy. You know, they had, the military had that for seven years and nobody knew. It really was Al Gore that came over and said to him, really was, is there any chance we could take this most unbelievable thing I've ever seen, could we throw it out to commerce? Vince Cerf allowed me to write this in something I wrote, because it's not very complimentary to him. He said, it's fine with me, but I don't know what value anybody will have for it. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, but you think about how much opportunity there is yet for commercialization. You wonder if the United States of America still in, innovates more than the whole world put together, but we're not very good at selling it yet. But anyway, this uh, little big kid goes to public schools, <clears throat> and he gets diagnosed, not with dyslexia, but he's deaf. You know what we called it back then clinically? Deaf and dumb. This guy gets coded as deaf and dumb. So then you know what happens? You get put in the deaf and dumb school. <clears throat> How could you be focusing more on weaknesses, by the way, than doing that? So we got to have tax money, and you got to get somebody that'll spend some time working with him, and all that that kind of that kind of a thing. And uh, the teacher comes in, and she's got kind of a funny look on her face to the head person of the deaf and dumb school. And she said, have you seen how that one deaf and dumb kid can do math? I'm not overdoing deaf and dumb. That was a clinical word. Uh, you don't, obviously, you don't say it now, but you see how that one guy can do math. She said, I haven't. Let me see it. And he looked and went, holy cow. They gave him a bunch more stuff. He put together fast. The deaf and dumb kid could put math together faster than any, anybody else. He was a genius. He went on to make a discovery bigger than Thomas Edison's. That's a story about Vint Cerf. Vint Cerf was deaf and dumb. But it makes you wonder when you look at people, how many are we missing? I mean, how many people? There was a genius in the deaf and dumb kid. What if that lady hadn't come over and said, hey, can you see how he does math? That one teaching moment changed the world, changed America, let us lead the world. But I was. <clears throat> thinking about that, and I wanted to just lay a little bit of track for you. I don't know if I can do this or not, but uh, so the, I've done the same thing for 50 years. I've studied really soft things. Ask people questions, write down what they said, then go tell somebody what they saw. You guys, you know, 50 years ago when I would do that, people would say to me, we don't believe in that. You don't believe in what? We don't believe in whatever that polling stuff is. I always tell them, you cannot believe in Santa, you cannot believe in the Easter Bunny, I can do those, <clears throat> but you can't not believe in asking a person a question, writing the answer down, then, then putting a, a, little bit of math, a little bit of math to it. <clears throat> but you always get labeled as having a lot of warm and fuzzy stuff when I really want to deal with CEO with the hard facts. I want to deal with money. But it brings you to a question. When do feelings become facts? Maybe the problem is you're looking at a fact, but you call it a feeling because you don't know how to get it to a fact. So I was sitting in here <clears throat> very recently with Dr. Cerf, and then the head of the National Science Foundation came over. By the way, if you say Vince in the surf, anybody in science will come over right will come over right away. It's like saying, I got Ben Franklin in here. You, you got any time to spend with us? He came over. The country needs a really big breakthrough. We don't have enough entrepreneurship. We all try, there are centers all over. It's not working as well as we think. We start about four hundred thousand companies a year. We need to be at about six hundred thousand to have this have this thing really go. It's very, very fixable, but you gotta be able to get some measurement. But Dr. Surf said something that still, I can't get it out of my head. But I don't know who he was speaking to. He wasn't necessarily speaking to that guy or the people on my team, but he said, 
All big world breakthroughs and world change begin with one question. You know what it is? What can you measure? What can you measure? He's real gifted in outer space. So there's a lot of, you know, there's thousands of low orbiting satellites just outside the Van Allen belt. He's real good at that. That's probably where we'll have war. But you see, when Elon Musk says, I'm going to colonize Mars, you can't colonize. You, somebody's going to do that. Americans will colonize the damn place. It's incredible. <laughs> Seems like we got enough problems here to go start, them, start more problems on, on, <laughs> on Mars. But how can you go to Mars if you don't know how far away it is? How far away? You know, we put a man on the moon, Van, James Van Allen and Eisenhower did, but somebody, the sun's out there 90 million miles, I think, 90 million. So how far is the moon? 10 million, 20 million, I don't know. It's out there 200,000. It's not very far. So those two guys had to figure that out. 200,000, these cab drivers put that on in a few. You can kind of drive your car to the moon. But what if you had had those backwards? You know what I mean? You, you, can't, get, you can't get started. <clears throat> but the problem with facts, especially when they're economics, I'm going to say an operating statement. When you win a customer or you lose a customer, that's easy. We want that. Write it down. It's pretty much cash flow. You know what the problem is with that? It happened after the fact. It's a trailing indicator. And you see, so if you can get some, if you can get some math over on the left-hand side of the curve, as managers, we can still step in and fix it. I'm watching my 20 minutes. When I look up like that... <clears throat> But how do you make, when are feelings facts? I uh, lived in Georgetown for 20 years. Now my wife and I moved out to McLean. But I walked into the Barnes & Noble. I'm still not over it, but I was going to buy a magazine for $10. And it's the um, U.S. News & World Report that has the rank of colleges in there, you guys. It has the SAT scores, that little band. So it'll say 1,200 to 30. By the way, if your children aren't in that band, they're not getting in. I called one and said, well, what if my boy had invented fire, if I could prove that? Could he get in then? The wheel? My boy got that one. Um, so I, I really needed it. It's on the magazine stand on M Street, right? You, some of you have been there before. But anyway, it wasn't there. So there's a young lady there, a clerk, and I start walking toward her, and she's on the phone. She's saying, yeah, and like when the club closed, we like, uh, the, the, the limo like pulled up, and then uh, we uh, uh, went for breakfast, and like the, uh, the, the, I have two daughters, I know the conversation. <laughs> but I was in a hurry, and I wanted, so I started walking toward her, and she just puts the phone up like this, <laughs> didn't get off, just put it up like this. She goes, can I help you? I could tell she didn't want to help me. And I said, um, yeah, I said I was looking for the magazine US News and all that. And she said, was it there? <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. And I, and I said, it wasn't. And she says, then we don't have it. She went back to, went back to her call. <clears throat> well, I had a feeling right then. And the feeling was I'd like to burn Barnes & Noble down. <laughs> burn. And uh, it really did, you know. I'm, <clears throat> You know, for however old you all are, it's really a moment where you get a feeling that goes through you that's not good. But so I'm going to walk out. But here's the point. I don't know if they had that magazine there or not, but that's zero. But the feeling happened before that. I'm never coming back again. I'm going to tell everybody not to go there and all that. So put that right there. Feelings fact is zero. So I'm walking out, there's another guy from a team, I can tell he's from the Stackers team, I used to work in a bookstore in Nebraska a long time ago, huge books, but anyway, he just kind of looks up at me, I don't know if he's trained to do it or not, but he said, can I help you find something? I was like, yeah, I don't know, matches, kerosene, this, get out of here son, this place is coming down, or I don't know what, but anyway, <clears throat> I told him what I needed and he, and he said, hey, um, 
And he says, are we out of it? I said, yeah, but anyway, he said, did you know there's a hardback that even tells you what schools are most likely to do tendencies? And I said, what? And he goes, yeah, come on. So we go running up the escalator, and I, I mean, you can, I can hear harps and angels singing and everything else. It's a hardback book, it's 30 bucks, and it's got everything I need. Now, we're, now, now we've got another fact, we're at 30. Then you know what the guy said to me? He said, is there anything else I can help you find? I said, yeah. I said, I need that book, United States of Europe, you got it? And he said, we do. I said, may I ask you a question? I said, it's very hard to read. I don't like things that are hard to read. I need big print. He goes, I think it's okay. Let's go look. So we went and looked. Got that one, too. Now I'm up to 60. Here's the point. Same employees, same bill. Everything's the same. Different supervisors. The feeling that I had is, one, never coming back, burn the place down. But the big one is, no money at all. Zero. Now, if you got your MBA, do you know what they'll teach you about that zero? They'll teach you you don't know the supply chain. And they'll teach you Six Sigma, and they'll teach you lean management, because you were supposed to get the $10. You see, that's because they understand the world through transactions, not through feelings. So that'll save you the $10. One of the things that this Nobel Prize winner, Danny Kahneman, along with Gallup, figured out was every decision that we make, a little bitty one, from where you sat today to whom you married to what house you're going to buy, you guys, 70% of it's emotional. But what we assume is that we always make the best decision based upon money, and we don't. It's more emotional. But you see, we build a pretty fantastic society working just off of that. What if we went into the 70%, got that codified, you probably could get a breakthrough someplace where nobody else thought it was. But think of the money difference. So the young lady, zero. The young kid, 60. Let's give her credit. Let's say the son, that an MBA would come over and say that, so you get the 10, but still it's a $50 difference. You know what the boy's mistake was? I'm going to call him a boy, so young. Young man. Is he didn't go again. He's, anything else? What if he, if he would have said to me, do you have any gifts coming up? Any birthdays? Anybody coming to town? Anything? Because, you know, they got puzzles in Barnes & Noble, you know, where you can put together the, the, the Capitol or the Jefferson Monument or something like that. It, seriously, it could have taken me to 6700. Six, <laughs> seriously. I, there's all kinds of stuff I needed. But you get the extreme difference. The entire system of leadership, measurement, transactions, and econo economics have us trapped in that little bitty, that little bitty, that little bitty thirty percent. Question is, when are feelings facts? So we can get some math to them, and when are facts money? I want to make sure I keep this right. On. We started a little bit late. I want to. Oh, that's when I was in high school. That's great. <laughs> Can you put up, men, can you put up that, the, I want to show you guys something. This is, we did a study, so we have like 20 million employee interviews in a tank. So when our scientists dive in to do a pearl dive and try to find something, they have, they have more data than kind of like everybody else put together. It's an algorithm that attempts to explain the role human nature plays in the most hardcore business outcomes you can imagine. Let's see it. <clears throat> Let's do th all three of them, Kirk, please. That's, what, that's, as, that's as far as it goes right there. I'll give you one more. But, but what we're all going for when you have a Wharton MBA is you're trying to get stock increase. And you go on, if you do this really well, if you can work those three really well, you, the ultimate is to go to Goldman Sachs. That's like playing for the Los Angeles Rams or something. Every time you get profit to go up, 80% of the time it drives your stock price. You can be like Elon today and say, I am going to buy Twitter after all, and it jumps up 22%, so you get some kind of PR moments like that. <clears throat> what drives that is actually just sales increase. You can, drive, you can get profit increase also by having big cost cutting, wiping out half your middle managers. You can do a lot of stuff like that. But the most predictable way is just that. Can you show me the next one, please, Kirk? That's the first breakthrough with emotional facts, and that is customer satisfaction. 
most people have about 25% of their <coughs> customers are satisfied. If you want to go from 25, if you go from 25 to 35, it hits the next ball, hits the next ball, hits the next ball, and you get stock increase. That's a breakthrough. That's one Gallup got about 20 years ago, and it tends to be just because of Kurt engaged employees. And so you'll get, there's an incredible variation like within Walmart. They'll have one store that's just great and another, and everything's the same. The choice products are the same and all that. But you get most all of the variation. You just go to, when, when employees are spirited like the one guy was and when they're miserable like the young woman was, you get really different outcomes. This makes a lot of sense, but maybe the biggest discovery that our current chief that's come out of our place in a long time is that the variance between good and bad organizations or teams. Remember, if you're doing a Six Sigma project, you can get, if you find variation is six or eight percent, and then you lean it out, it's a big deal. Stock goes up and you're man or woman of the month and all that kind of a thing. He came out scratching his head one time and he said, we've never seen anything like this. The difference between high performance teams, kind of like Navy SEALs, they do things that look impossible to us, and people that just screw up everything they do. 70% of the variation can be described by one phenomenon, just the manager. Just the manager. I said, then what's your biggest takeaway? And he said, my biggest takeaway is all the things we do that we think work, it's all imagined. He said, none of it works. Performance management systems filling out stuff on each other, but we've really trained the whole world to be administrative managers and fill out stuff. You know what you do? You don't get any human development. You get zero. A big famous company, we talked them into just stopping all of it. They have 700,000 employees, almost everybody's a professional. One day their CEO just on a high courage day said, shut the whole friggin' thing off. Change the whole thing to strengths based. They've just absolutely exploded. They have a totally different uh, uh, cognitive sort of expansion that goes on every day that nobody else does. Can I put that, can I see that next one? If you learn anything from this, feelings to facts, the fact is, is that when you have a manager that coaches rather than just keeps track of me, everything changes. Um, speeding this up, the first thing people usually say to me is, what exactly does a coaching manager do? There's an answer, and it's so important. If you get it wrong, it doesn't matter all the other good things you can do as a manager because you will fail. You, that person will not develop unless you do this one. You have to identify their strengths and then give them a role that fits their strengths. If you screw that up, just go back to work and keep track of them. But if you can give them a role that God gave them a capacity to perform that task, that's the single biggest breakthrough we've had. That's why, Anna, that's why we went so deep into determining people's strengths. Because a guy named Don Clifton figured out, in the last letter he wrote, he said, I think my biggest breakthrough is not that the variation of who we are is only 34 different thought patterns or life themes, but great leaders, there is no single taxonomy. The world's trying to make us all, America's always trying to make you into Colin Powell, the greatest guy that's ever lived, or at least in our last 50 years. Or they used to try to make me into Jack Welch, that, you know, that was the other one. But like you always said, Colin Powell and Jack Welch have more differences than they do things in common, but yet we keep trying to make all of us into one of them, people have different, different ways that they can pull it off. You have that next one, Kurt? That's your big takeaway. Coaching manager and strengths to roll. You'll not only change your organization. If we get this thing to keep going, America will have a renaissance of productivity, which is so, which is so desperately needed. I'm going to give you one example. Then I'll, it looks like I'm going to go over about three minutes, but... You know, if you're going to coach basketball, did anybody watch or play basketball? Some of you ladies were basketball players. There you go. Uh, Kelly, the I used to play basketball and coach basketball. The entire game is just pick and roll. Did you know that? 
There's nothing else going on. So you say, what about on defense? You're defending against the pick and roll. And if you say, well, I'm going to try my own way, don't. You'll always lose. And it's, uh, when you see coaches out there, you've got a talent, like we're talking about today. But when you coach them, whoever coaches, whoever coaches the pick and roll best is world, is, is world, is world champion. Same thing's true in football, blocking and tackling. I don't care if you throw the ball or if you have the very best receivers. Whatever it is, if you can't block and tackle, you'll never coach. What blocking and tackling and pick and roll is, that's what, that's what, that's what strengths and roll is here. I'm going to just suddenly end. I wanted to lay just a little bit of track with those and so you can keep thinking about it. My biggest one is as leaders, keep thinking about if you want to just suddenly go up 10 times look and see what are the emotions around me. All of us have customers. I don't care if you're a teacher, administrator, or an NGO, whatever. We all got customers. But what are the emotions between me and those customers that I can codify or that I can turn into facts? Because once you do, once you can measure it, you can always change it. Thank you very much for coming today.